So again, good morning. Welcome to the first day of the Uptime event here in, um, well, I should say DCD Uptime event here in um, New York. Uh, today is of particular interest to me. Hopefully, uh, you'll, you all will find uh, similar value in the content. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Teeley. I am, um, for the moment at least, CIO and CSO at Absera, but um, we were recently acquired by Ericsson, so now I am an Ericsson employee, and so my future title is yet to be determined. But uh, a big part of what I do on a daily basis, both when I was with Absera and now at Ericsson, is worry about the edge, worry about um, cloud, worry about infrastructure, worry about data centers, worry about the networking, and, and to a large degree, um, help Ericsson with uh, some of their partners try to figure out what business models might be accommodated at the edge. And so I've actually done quite a bit of writing recently about the edge. If any of you are really bored and um, need something to do on breaks in between, you can go to my LinkedIn profile and see what I've wrote, written recently about the edge, um, which is probably where DCD decided to um, ask me to get involved. But um, you know, the day today is is filled with some some really smart people. I mean, uh, the gentleman that comes on uh, right after I relinquish the stage. Uh, from LinkedIn, Yuval from LinkedIn, is um, doing some incredible things. And he will tell you how much they're expanding what they're doing uh, and what that means from an infrastructure and demand standpoint and what that means at the edge for them. But um, the way I see this market is, um, is that to take a little bit from the quote from um, Michael Dell where he said, I think he said that the edge is likely to be 100 times what uh, public cloud is. Um, I have a hard time getting to that number. He could be right, but I have a hard time getting to that number, but I don't have a hard time at all getting to a number of five to 10x what public cloud is. And um, it's not a stretch to think that there's somewhere between 20 and 30 million servers in the public cloud sector today, maybe more. And so 5x of that is a considerable number. Um, and so you'll hear topics throughout the day about why go to the edge? How do you get to the edge? What does the edge actually mean? Who's doing things there today? What are some of the considerations? Should you go alone? Should you partner? Um, I don't know that there's one answer. I think it really will depend, and, and you will probably learn throughout the day that there, it will depend on what it is you're doing and how you're trying to get there and how you're trying to make money. But I think the key for almost every business, whether you're, whether you're in, to use the, the gold mining um, days of 1849 California, whether you're shell it, selling Levi's and, and shovels or actually mining for gold, the opportunity is there at the edge. Um, there's just too much growth uh, potentially happening there. And, and as we've seen with the history of technology adoption, as the technologies become more capable and the corresponding price goes down, new business models are created. Uh, and the edge is just beginning to see what some of those business models might be. Uh, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the Pokemon story of a couple of years ago. Um, imagine having 20 or 30 companies try to do that at the edge today uh, versus after 5G is, is more prevalent um, uh, or after before more data center and network capacity is brought out to the edge from the core. Uh, and that's just one example. Uh, there are th literally thousands of other examples. So anyway, um, Without further ado, thank you very much for showing up. Uh, I think you will enjoy the day. Feel free to come find me. I should be wandering around uh, if you have any questions or concerns or, or think that um, uh, we should add or change something, feel free to come search me out. Uh, again, my name is Mark Teeley, but uh, with further, without further ado, I'd like to welcome you all to the stage. Clicker. Morning, everybody. My name is Yuval. I'm, I work for the infrastructure group of LinkedIn, building the future of LinkedIn's data centers, working on architecture, and working uh, on aspects of the network of the future uh, on top of the LinkedIn data center itself. Uh, today, I'm, gonna, I'm here to talk about something called Edge Cloud. Uh, that, first of all, we need to find a better name for that thing, but uh, for now, it stays Edge Cloud. <laughs> Uh, Edge Cloud, in my opinion, and I think following Mark's uh, statement, is going to be the future of the data centers. Uh, cloud data centers are capped at some point uh, to a certain size. The edge is uncapped right now. 
And I'll show in a minute why it is and uh, where we're going to end up with. Okay. So let's start with uh, living on the edge. W what is an edge cloud? So a lot of people have a complete different set of uh, explanations of what edge cloud is and how it looks like. The way I look at this is edge cloud is compute storage and network at the cell tower. And it's important to be at the cell tower and not one layer in, because one layer in, in my opinion, is not the edge. One layer in something else, it's not the cloud, but it's not the edge. It's actually higher latency, it's higher level of, of uh, complexity, it's non-distributed exchange. It's a very, very different architecture and very, very different technology. It needs to be looked at separately. A lot of the, of the cellular operators will actually want to move the edge to their center offices, but I think the right center office, the right, the right point for the edge cloud is not in the center office, but at the cell tower. It requires for us to be really, really close to the RAN. And only by doing that with 5G, with the latency numbers and the performance numbers we get from 5G, we'll be able to actually break through to a completely new set of applications, completely new sets of experiences for the people at the endpoint, or for the components at the endpoint. It doesn't have to be people. Right? In the future, in the next five years, the people are going to be the minor of the number of com components connecting to the network. We want to give the same experience of low latency, extremely high bandwidth to the cars and to the cameras and to the security systems, which are completely non-human. Okay? It's beyond IoT. A lot of people associate edge with IoT. It's not just IoT. It's a combination of all those elements which requires this set of extreme bandwidth, extreme low latency, and processing at a very, very close point to where the edge is. And it requires, it's a place where we optimize performance and we optimize application localization. And, that, and I'll talk about this in more details, but application localization is very important because application localization shows that if you're in the, my proximity in the next 10 cell spaces around me, you'll get a certain level of performance from a latency and form a, a compute capability. If you go out, it's a similar concept to a cloud that we have today, okay? What is, what is special about this? Why, why is edge cloud different than standard cloud? First, it's an extremely diversified environment. You can be in the desert somewhere under a cell tower, and you can be somewhere at the minus 20 degrees uh, somewhere else, and. You can be under the cell tower, you can be next to the cell tower, you can be in an uncontrolled environment. So it's extremely diversified with, from how much power you have, what kind of cooling you can get, what is the rack system you could put in there, because some places will not let you roll in, let's say, a, a large rack. Some people will not enable you at all to do rack and roll, because you cannot rack and roll because the truck cannot get there. Some people actually require special security. So if you, do, if you drive some applications, one of the things that are really easy today with the cloud, right? The cloud is a building which is fully secured. You cannot never get in. Your data is fully secured inside. You don't have to worry about this. When you go to the edge, suddenly you're in the base of a cell tower. There's nothing there. There's no guard. There's barely a fence around it that you can jump over very easily. So security is becoming a major issue that you have to address. It is extremely distributed. So if you look at the way Data centers are being optimized today, and LinkedIn is doing this, and all the cloud operators doing that. When we concentrate a lot of servers in one location, we can optimize it really, really well. We can optimize how we do power distribution, how we do cooling. When you start distributing to 1,000 locations compared to 100 locations, it's becoming a completely different problem to solve. You have a smaller footprint of 50 to 175K. You, you put 100 to 500 servers per location, no more than that, because you don't have enough space to do that. You have to build a new network architecture because now the, the original network architecture where everything is funneling into the cloud, being processed and being funneled out, is not working anymore. Now you need to talk between cell towers in a direct way because you want the experience of the car who connects to this cell and the car who connects to this cell to be exactly the same. So the app has to talk to the next cell. That network does not exist to date. They all go into a central point, exchange over there, and then go back. That doesn't work for those cars. They need this one millisecond break command and say stop now, because otherwise you're going to hit the car in front of you. So distributed architecture of the network has to be reinvented. You have to create something called distributed exchange. The exchange point concept that we had before, where everything is going to one exchange point, and everybody comes in there and then exchange the bits, doesn't work anymore, because the latency to go there and come back 
is too high. Now, all of these guys are actually coming to the cell tower. There's no reason for us to backhaul into an exchange point and back. They are at the exchange already. We just need to build a distributed exchange and do it at the cell tower. When we do that, that will solve a lot of our problems. And distributed management. Again, it's very easy for us to manage data centers at large scale when they're concentrated. When they are spread around, it's much more complicated. It's from the redundancy perspective. What happens if one of the cell towers go down? Because in a data center, we know very well how to handle a rack go down, a row goes down, a whole data center goes down. In this case, you're becoming much more localized. How do you make sure that the next cell tower actually contains the data that you have in this cell tower just in case it goes down? So all of that needs to be reinvented. Those are things which are not there. We don't do it very well today, and we have to reinvent it. On the other side of this, we have to do a very strong integration. Application handoff is something which is going to be really complicated to do. If you remember 10 years back, what was the biggest problem with cell phones? We would cross cell boundary, we would drop the call. Right? We didn't know how very well how to do a handoff of calls. We fixed that. Now imagine doing that with an with a app which is streaming megabits per second into the cell tower, and you have to hand it off to another cell tower. What do you do there? How do you do this? How do you integrate those apps together? How do you do localization? How do you maintain data which is reliably maintained, securely maintained, but it's localized? It's not distributed. You can backhaul it afterwards, but in general, it needs to stay localized. How do you do services handoff? If you, if you have a certain level of services in cell tower X, how do you do a handoff to the next cell tower and you make sure it's the same handoff? How do you do jumping from one, one uh, cellular provider to the other? All those things are things that are special in the edge cloud. Some of them have been invent invented, some of them needs to be invented, some of them needs to be researched. But all of that will actually make the, the edge cloud something different than the standard cloud that we have. If you look just from the, by the numbers, how many components are going to be connected to the network in 2022? The estimates that we've seen right now is about 33 billion. That is a number which is a little bit mind boggling because 33 billion is like, going to be between 3 and 4x the number of humans, which means that the humans' are effect on the network is starting to diminish slowly because they are not always on, for example. A camera always pushes video on. A snowflake kid, which is just doing his Instagram, they're putting up a, a, a video every hour, every two hours. It's not always on. Low latency is going to become really, really critical because when you have so many components, there's no way to aggregate all the information to a single central point. You have to do low latency, very, very high performance uh, processing very close to where it is because there's no way for us to actually put it back from a network capacity. Extremely high bandwidth is going to be required by those elements. 5G will give it to us. And hopefully 5G will, will emerge faster than, than anybody, anything else. But we have to do it in the same way that actually 5G will have value. Just giving 5G to carry bits and giving faster bits to your phone, it's not really going to make it. We have to actually make things much better than that. We have to move, we have to deal with a situation where some of those devices are moving fast, like cars, and some of them are stationary, not moving ever. This is a very strong variety on how the data is being produced and given into the edge. And you have to deal with all the extremes, from stationary to a 90 miles an hour car. How do you deal with that? The 90 miles an hour car is actually skipping cell tower every few minutes or every few seconds in some cases. You have to do a, a solution which is complementary to people, not just people. Today, a lot of our focus is how do we actually serve apps which are coming for people. We, don't have to, we won't have to do that in the future. We have to do something which is complementary to people. How do people experience? the elements which are connected to the network and not just how they actually experience their own phone. If you look at the, at the amount of data which is going to be uh, available for the network at that time frame, you're talking about 80 zettabytes of data being generated. If you think about this, the number is like really, really high from every aspect of how you look at this. The number is high from perspective of the generation, the amount of my data generated is so high that there is no feasible way in our current networks to backhaul this whole thing into our data centers. I imagine we want, don't want to do edge cloud. We want to just backhaul everything to the data center. This amount of data is just not possible for us to 
backhaul it to data center in real time. It's just not, it's just too much data. And there's a lot of data which will actually come and have to be stored. It can be stored in the, in the cloud as a, back, as a backup aspect, but it has to be processed at that level of data with thousands of locations at the edge. And I know some people will say, no, 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 we can take everything in. There's no problem with that, right? The problem is not the back-end cloud services. The problem is actually the network to get to them. That network will not handle this amount of bandwidth. Let's look at new applications which are actually driving this demand. Self-driving car is one of them, and there's many more. This is just a sample of that. Self-driving cars, why do self-driving cars even care about edge processing? Most of the processing today in self-driving cars is actually in the car. So it's not done off the car, right? But when you start communicating with the car next to you, behind you, in front of you, or two miles ahead of you, you have to actually do processing which is localized. That goes to the localization of the data because the value of the data of your car to the four cars ahead of you has a lifetime of probably 10 seconds, 15 seconds. There's no, it makes no sense for us to pull it back into the cloud and in. And if we have to take actions based on the data that we actually communicate between the cars, going back into the cloud and in, and even if you can guarantee 30 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds in some of the cloud services, it's still too slow to actually make an emergency break. It's still too slow to actually take actions which are a little bit more aggressive than actions of processing at the general traffic patterns in the, in the maps, right? All those things will have to be processed locally, take decisions processed locally, and take actions back into the car locally. And imagine a lot of those cars, it makes the problem even bigger because the amount of data now is really, really large, but the data is always localized. I don't care about the car in New York City if I'm in London. And I don't care about, about a car which is five miles ahead of me if there's nothing happening in the traffic. But I do care about the car in front of me. And if it's about to do something wrong, or the driver uh, lost his control, or something happened, I want to know as soon as possible, because I need to actually take action on that. Another one is the, is the smart cities. Smart cities are, have a lot of variance on that. There's like probably a decade that people talk about smart cities and not much is happening beyond a lot of cameras over where, everywhere, privacy is gone forever, we never get our privacy back. Uh, but right now the smart cities are going to the domain where people are, people are not the driving force into smart cities, it's the components which actually sit as smart components in our homes, in our cars, on, on, in our phones, and everywhere around us, which are actually collecting information and need to process it. Some of the processing of the information does not need to be at the edge. If you, are, if you are looking at a traffic camera, it doesn't have to be processed at the edge. But if you're looking at security aspects of certain uh, locations, the immediate response needs to be actually, can be processed at the edge and actually can be acted on at the edge. AR and VR, and I think the, the example for Pokemon before was there. Imagine that you have an experience right now that if you are around me and you're running a VR system, you are actually one millisecond away from me. The experience of that gaming level is, is actually a completely different experience than the one anybody has today. Any gaming system today, which is actually shared across the network, has a certain latency built into it. If you look at how Xbox work or Xbox Live works or anybody else, they assume hundreds of milliseconds, in some cases seconds of delay between the endpoints. Imagine now gaming in an environment with a one millisecond away. It's real life. Any action that you take, the gamers that play with you are actually one millisecond away from you they can actually react very fast, and you can react very fast to what they're doing. It's a completely different experience. Now add to that VR, and you basically create a completely different era of, of gaming in this domain completely. 5G is clearly needs to be there, needs to actually enable us the high performance that it's gonna give us, needs to have, give us the latency to actually materialize some of this. Even though you can get low latency in 4G LTE as well, but you won't be able to get the bandwidth that these elements will start producing in the future for VR and, and, uh, and the AR environments. And lastly, industrial autom automation. Lastly, industrial automation is more localized. It's close to the smart cities, but it's localized to the, to the factories themselves. These guys are much more localized. The, the amount of event in industrial automation that requires this edge processing is small. However, the edge processing is apl applicable for the industrial automation because these industrial automation are usually air-gapped from the world. They're not connected to the network. They actually do a lot of decisions locally, but they're not on the network. 
So in reality, what they're implementing, they're implementing edge cloud in their locations without the need to have the complex network around them. For, to do that, we have to actually do something which is a little bit extreme over here, but we need to have a new internet. Uh, the internet, the way it is right now for best effort, just does not answer what we need, does not give us enough what we need. And because of that, a lot of, a lot of cloud operators went and built their own networks, right? They, they didn't rely on the over the top, right? Because over the top is best effort. It's not good enough for most of the stuff that we need. If we need to go at the, at the one millisecond to 100 microseconds, the internet, the way it's built today, is just not there. We have to rebuild it in a localization and a network, and I'll show one example on how to do it in a second. Same thing for the cloud services. Cloud services from all the cloud operators were giving you regional re re resiliency. They basically say, if you're in one region, we guarantee you a session SLA. You're always gonna get that SLA, no problem with you. But right now, we have to go to a fully distributed cloud services. How do we do that? It's not regional anymore. You can't really back up one data center with another data center and create a regional experience. You have to create localized experience. It's very, very different. Localized resiliency, it's very different. It's something that needs to be done properly. How do you create local resiliency? What happens if a cell tower goes down? What happens if two cell towers go down? That is an event that, could, that is much more common than a data center going down. Data center going down is a really, really rare event. But a, a localized cell tower, or somebody cut the wire, or somebody ran with, with, a, with a tractor and basically un unplugged the, 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 the wires for data or for power, that is a very common event that can happen. And create a perfect exchange. The exchange right now is probably 25 years old from the way it was defined. We need to redefine this exchange, how this exchange is happening. And some of the, some of the providers are starting to think about it and how they want to do exchange. Exchange is not really something simple that you want to do in a great place. You can actually do it local. So what is the new internet? <laughs> With an E, sorry. <laughs> Inventing a new word over here. <laughs> the new internet is the uh, edge internet. It's an internet that enables us to do all the things that we talked about. Ultra high performance, very localized environment, very low latency, very high performance, and heavy connection to the backbone to actually go back to the best effort environment but still have a very strong network which is very localized and very, very optimized for the future of the solutions. Let's, create, let's look at an example of that. What is in the edge in general? So the future of the edge, the way I see it, you can imagine yourself a sphere around Earth and you tap into it anywhere you are. So you basically, you basically go into an event where you say, okay, there's a sphere around me, and no matter where I am and what I carry, and, and if I'm static or if I'm a, a human or not a human, I just connect to that sphere. That sphere will actually connect me. It will give me an experience for the local, but it'll also connect me to the rest of the world. It will give me zero latency and unlimited bandwidth, which is gonna be the case for 90% of the apps. They're gonna get zero latency from an app perspective and unlimited bandwidth, and then let's see what the next generation of software writers will actually do with that when you give them zero latency and unlimited bandwidth. And then we take it from there and say, okay, what can we do with that? So we need to build, first of all, a new network. Let's look at the network. Inside the cell tower is very simple. We put 500 servers. We know extremely well how to do that. Anybody who built any data centers for cloud or for enterprise, this is one architecture which is pretty straightforward. But now you need to start, start binding it together. So you take five cell towers or six cell towers locations and you need to bind them together. How do you bind them together? How do you create a network which is fully meshed and enabled you, enables you to actually create this connectivity on a cell space. And then you need to take that and replicate it thousands of times. And then you get that thing. That is a three-dimensional mode of actually connecting all those together. You just created a new topology for a network which says, okay, this new topology is not the old internet. It's not best effort anymore because I control the network in a much better way. But it's just one example. There can be another hundred different examples of how to run this topology. If you look at edge technology today, what is available today? So this is one solution which Vapor is offering. Vapor is a company who's doing cell tower uh, integration. They have a, con a container style uh, module and a, a very special rack space inside which has all the things that we talked about from a security perspective and from a capacity perspective. This is like a real life the demonstration of that. You can see this in the cell tower. You can see the edge of the cell over there. This is how it works. This is edge 
cloud. This is putting a cloud services with hundreds of servers at the cell tower, being able to give services everywhere you want. Another example of that is what LinkedIn is doing. LinkedIn is doing something called Edge Connect. This is a two years old program, which we started before Edge Connect was really, or Edge in general was actually really fancy and, and uh, sexy. We said, okay, how do we optimize our localized experience for our users with LinkedIn? We said, okay, what is taking us so long? Some of the things that takes us long is actually authentication and the first page, right? So we took a system and we built a micro data center with eight to 16 servers in them, a single switch, which is actually doing both 40 gig of peering and 40 gig of over the top transit and doing user, user authentication and CDN function, that's it. So when you open up your phone and you go to LinkedIn, you basically get something right away. How do you get something right away? Two things happen. One is some of it is cached on your phone, some of it is on the first level of authentication. And that's what this thing is doing. It's giving you the first page. I'll, I'll tell you a little secret, right? If you open up your, uh, your uh, LinkedIn app, you get the, the last page you had before, if you notice that. And there's a little bubble on the top saying, hey, there's more news, click here. Why do we have that? Because we need the time to actually bring you this other page, right? And a human responds to that in a relatively slow pace, so it takes about a second. A second from our perspective is infinite time. We can bring you whatever we want. But this thing is actually enable you to authenticate really, really fast. So you will get your first page really, really fast. We are seeing between 15 and 50% improvement on how the, the app is responding when we're using this environment. We started deploying this. It's right now deployed in five locations. We play, plan to deploy this in many, many other locations as well. So in summary, the Edge Cloud is here and it's now. So if you think it's just something which is gonna come in the next five to 10 years, it's not. It's here and it's now. It's happening and the demand is created now. So if you're playing in it, you're actually gonna be able to shape it in the way it's gonna look. If you wanna wait another three to four years, that's fine, but then you'll have to take whatever is gonna be given to you. The applications are being built around Edge Cloud. So there's a lot of applications right now which are built for Edge Cloud and they're built exactly for the low latency, high bandwidth that 5G is gonna to offer to us in the next couple of years. The technology and business opportunity is enormous. I wouldn't say 100x, but I agree totally with 10x is completely visible. With tens of thousands of locations in the US, hundreds of thousands of locations, if not millions of locations outside of US. China has 1.8 million cell towers. Imagine 10 servers in every location, that's 18 million servers, <laughs> okay? So the only thing I can say, Edge Cloud is here and now, be a part of it, contribute to it, work on it, and actually make it successful. Thank you. Do we do questions or are we doing questions? Let's, let's, folks, we're running a little bit behind, but we've got to take at least one question. Who'd like to volunteer a question? Sure. sure. So that's an interesting question. So in general, there are different forces pulling this right now. One force is actually the operators of the cellular would like to actually do that, but they don't like to be at the cell tower. They would like to actually take it to, the, to their offices. The second level is I expect the cloud operators like the Amazons and the Googles and the Microsoft of the world will start giving services at the edge. I am, I'm almost sure this is gonna happen. Okay? And that's not for internal information from Microsoft, it's just, it's just that's, that's, that's a natural thing for them. They, they give the services at the cloud, there's no reason for them not to give it at the edge. It's exactly the same service model. And lastly, it's independent companies. Independent companies that own the cell towers, the cell towers are now being owned by companies which are not really well known, it's more real estate companies, but they're starting to expand and offer both the infrastructure, and I'm sure in some cases, in combination with other companies, like Packet, for example, they will offer services at the edge, completely agnostic of the service providers, and they will give an exchange option. So if you're AT&T and you want to do exchange with me at the cell tower, go for it. I'm here, right? If you want to go backhauling and then come back in, that's fine as well. But the exchange is still going to stay at the cell tower. All right? Thank you, Thank you very much. Great stuff.